There are new reports saying that the Biden administration has given out so much military assistance to Ukraine to combat Russian forces that it has risked not having enough weapons to help defend Taiwan should China attack. To talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining us from the Foreign Desk in Los Angeles. Lisa, the claims are being made by former top national security officials. It's mind-boggling, right, to think that a world power like the United States that is very calculated in its military efforts, in its military assistance, would make this uh, maybe, I guess, miscalculated uh, step in, um, you know, providing Ukraine with so much aid, I mean, let alone all the money, the billions of dollars that have gone into this, and then the, the military uh, weaponry, the, uh, enough that we would leave ourselves perhaps vulnerable uh, to not having enough to help Taiwan should they need it. And as we know, uh, China is definitely uh, looking like it's going to uh, invade Taiwan sometime soon. It doesn't look like it's too far out, um, perhaps taking a page from Putin's handbook and seeing how uh, he has, has gone forward with you know, um, working against global uh, condemnation and not perhaps caring as much or, or seeing that there aren't too many consequences. The only consequence here is all the money and uh, military uh, apparatuses that are being you know flooded into Ukraine, but then uh, just waiting for Putin to take the next step. So um, yeah, Xi Jinping of, of China will, will perhaps think that uh, that will be the same for him. And then the United States won't be able to perhaps insert itself or to assist Taiwan the way that they have pledged to do so. Remember, Nancy Pelosi made a visit there. We saw other lawmakers uh, copy her move and go there and, and, and give them uh, that vote of confidence that the United States is behind them. Well, perhaps not. So how would the Biden administration actually approach that if China did invade Taiwan? Would it be very similar to what happened when Russia invaded Ukraine? Just kind of give, you know, weaponry and then money? Perhaps. I mean, for right now, it's just uh, a little, uh, you know, rebuking them from the podium and um, showing more support towards Taiwan um, to perhaps deter China from making that move and also having some sort of presence uh, in and around uh, China uh, and Taiwan to show that that there is obviously interest in supporting and defending Taiwan should something happen. But again, hoping that uh, this deters China and they do not make the invasion. Lisa, there are reports that Iran is testing attack drones on Ukrainian civilians for potential future use on Israel. Now, this claim is by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry that said hundreds of these drones have allegedly been unleashed on civilians across Ukraine. Right. So we know that there have been deals made um, with Russia and many of the rogue adversaries uh, of the United States, including North Korea and the Iran regime. We know that they got uh, drones from the Iran regime. There were several visits by Russian officials to Iran since June, and that has been documented. Uh, and now, uh, Iran, the Iran regime has denied supplying drones to Russia, and we know, in fact, that those are Iranian drones. Uh, and the worry is that this is just a practice run for the Iran regime to see how their weapons uh, fare in the battlefield and then to perhaps use them on Israel, which is their closest uh, enemy. They Remember, the big Satan is the United States and the little Satan is Israel. Uh, and that has been the uh, narrative of this regime for 43 years. So, of of course, any uh, short term, uh, long, short range rather, uh, weaponry that they have, they would try to use it on Israel. And that is the worry. But of course, Ukraine is trying to warn us that this is not just an isolated case with Russia invading them, but that the ramifications of what's going on with this invasion will have reverberations all throughout the world, including the Middle East. Hundreds of protesters took to the streets in Toronto, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, where you are and Berlin to march in solidarity with Iranian protesters who are in favor of toppling the Islamic Republic. Lisa, the latest protests come as the regime officials, they're deploying more security forces throughout Iran. Iran is blaming the West and Israel naturally for propagating the demonstrations. Right, and they, they continue, right? So the crackdowns have never been this deadly. 
and juxtapose that with a population that has never been so brave. Uh, what we're seeing in Iran is incredible. We are seeing teenagers, children, uh, people in their teens and 20s coming out onto the streets so bravely and the regime shooting at them point blank. Imagine going to a peaceful protest and not knowing if you're going to make it back home. Uh, and that's exactly what's going on. This past week, I'll give you a few anecdotes. A 16-year-old girl was killed at her school because she refused to sing the anthem of the regime. Uh, another uh, athlete, 33 year old uh, Elnaz Rakabi, went to South Korea to compete in uh, wall climbing. She took off her hijab as a sign of solidarity with the women of Iran. She has been put under house arrest when she got back to Iran, her phone and all her possessions confiscated. There are so many examples of poets and musicians and writers and members of the opposition who have been arrested. There have been many who have been killed, again, point blank, sitting in their car and hawking their horn in, in support of the protesters that are marching by them and shot at, literally killed in their cars for just honking their horns. And this is what the Western mainstream media perhaps is missing, is that this has gone on for six weeks, six weeks of this bravery in the crackdowns being so horrifically brutal, but the people coming back out. And I'll tell you how everyone asks the question, what's different this time around? 43 years we've seen the Iranian people come out. And for 43 years, they've tried to tell the world that this is not the regime that they want. But each time it was classified by the West and the mainstream media and, you know, the, the leaders in the White House is something different egg protest and bizarre protest and it's over the economy and it's over this and it's over a fraudulent election. But this is the first time that the people in Iran and the people outside who support them have been able to be unified in one message alone. And that is that they want freedom and they want regime change. There's nothing else. There are no other specifics, no other nuances. That is what they want. And they are not beating around the bush. The slogans on the street, death to the dictator, they are absolutely clear in their message and they're unwavering in their message that they want this regime gone. Well, let me ask you bluntly, can the current Iran movement topple the regime in Iran? What needs to happen? probably the most important question. You cannot topple this regime without Western support, and you can't topple this regime without those protesters on the street. So it will require both. And the people in Iran are telling the White House that if you're not going to help us, at least don't stand in our way, meaning step away from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear negotiations, uh, put sanctions on this regime that will at least help us uh, you know, diminish the power and the, the tentacles of this regime or their economic ability or their nuclear ability or their ability to hire Basiji uh, um, fighters to come kill the protesters. They're telling us if you're not going to support regime change with which Robert Malley, who is the current uh, Iran envoy in the United States, he's the man who was hired for the sole purpose of getting back into the Iran nuclear negotiations. Uh, he has come out on his Twitter to say, we're not going to support a strategy of regime change, to which many Iranians came out and, and replied to him saying, we don't care. We're going to fight to get our country back. And that is the message that the Iranians are sending us right now. They want us to support them. But if we're not going to have a strategy of supporting regime change, they say at least walk away from the nuclear negotiations. Look, there's a big, there's a lot of daylight between not supporting regime change and giving this regime billions of dollars, right? So they're saying, at least don't get in our way. Don't give this, this regime more legitimacy, more money, more power. At least let us do what we're going to do. The hacktivist group known as Black Reward published documents from Iran's nuclear program after a 24-hour deadline it had given the Islamic government expired, Lisa. The group said it hacked the email system of Iran's nuclear power production development company and threatening to release the classified documents if the regime doesn't stop its crackdown on protesters. How significant was this? This is amazing. Look, imagine a society in which the hackers are with the people, uh, not against the people. They're not trying to get people's bank information and then credit card numbers. They're trying to work for the people in order to uh, basically motivate and bring some momentum to this and really intimidate members of the regime. There have been uh, the, the personal information of parliament members have been hacked by a different group. There are, I mean, in this case, there are actual secrets from their new 
nuclear files that were confiscated and they gave an ultimatum to the regime. Imagine hackers being able to be fighting for the people and the capacity of saying to the regime, either back off or this is gonna continue. It's quite significant and also points to modern warfare, right? Uh, this is a, a society in which you know, the people come out on social media and the government shuts them down. Uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei has a Twitter account, but he doesn't want other Iranians having uh, Twitter accounts or being online. So they want to use technology against the people, but the people use the technology right back. And in this case, hackers really using technology, re really using their cyber capabilities to intimidate, to, to harass, to threaten the regime, and to really be on the side of the people. Lisa, there are reports coming out how the United Nations and some other aid groups are allegedly informing migrants around the world how to get to the United States and then cross the border illegally. Six migrants from Afghanistan shared the story with the Daily Caller News Foundation after they were apprehended in Guatemala. Yeah, unbelievable, right? Imagine uh, whose side are they on, right? You think about the UN and uh, their responsibility to keep borders safe, to keep countries safe, to keep people safe. Why would you give migrants the uh, confidence or you know, the, the direction, the guidance to go through a route that is unsafe, that is illegal more than anything else? Uh, and again, you know, what about borders? What about laws? What about the legality of all of this? It's horrific. It's not the first time that we have seen such transgressions by the UN. Uh, I was on the ground in Syria uh, a few years ago and was able to you know, basically see these UN so-called peacekeepers and what they were up to. And, um, you know, it's, it's a waste of taxpayer money here in the United States, that's for sure. And I know that a lot of people agree with that statement. Um, but, you know, when you see things like this, you, you really question the role of the UN um, and their, their platform. Their, their, what are they entrusted to do and how are they carrying it out? Two different things. And in this case, we were fortunate to get these interviews uh, in Guatemala, but uh, we're not always fortunate to really catch them in the act and see what they're really up to. Now, speaking of the United Nations, there's a new finding by a UN Commission of Inquiry that Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory is now unlawful. I guess this shouldn't be surprising considering this is the second report unilaterally slamming Israel issued by the same body. Right. So perhaps the UN can't do its job because they are so preoccupied with slamming Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, and then perhaps putting, you know, uh, Iran's regime that is actually waging a war on women right now on the streets of Iran and putting them on the, uh, the, the Women's Rights Council. I mean, it's bogus. This is, again, just another stain on the UN and the fact that they do not stand for peace and prosperity. They do not support women's rights. They do not support human rights because if they did, they would not be so biased in uh, not condemning Iran's regime, but then condemning Israel. Again, uh, Israel has supported this, uh, this movement in Iran. A lot of their parliament members have cut their hair in solidarity. They have lit up their buildings with Iran's flag, um, shown so much solidarity and support for this current movement. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's tremendous to see the UN this body that really just tap, just pats itself on the back and thinks it's really the embodiment of um, human rights and, and really keeping uh, this standard. But then look at the hypocrisy. Lisa, the Anti-Defamation League is urging sportswear giant Adidas to end its partnership with rapper Kanye West over his alleged recent anti-Semitic comments. Now, there's word that West allegedly went on a podcast to brag that, quote, I can literally say anything anti-Semitic and they cannot drop me. I hope they do. I hope that he is proven wrong, that you cannot be a bigot, you cannot be an anti-Semite, you cannot hate and get away with it. He was dropped by designer Balenciaga um, in the past few days. But you know what, how people are listening. I know a lot of people want to dismiss him as somebody who's crazy and has gone nuts and he should not be listened to. And of course, that's all true. But his words mean something. Just over the weekend, there were banners on an, a major overpass here in Los Angeles on the 405 freeway, which is the most busy uh, freeway in this local Los Angeles area. Banners that say Kanye West was right. There are men standing on the overpass uh, with their Heil Hitler uh, hand gestures. Horrific, horrific. People are listening. People are taking uh, a cue from somebody who is a pop culture icon. 
you're a multi-billionaire. I mean, use your time and your words and your platform for good and not for hate. Uh, and I really think Adidas and everyone else should take this very seriously and come out to cancel him. Use cancel culture in the right way. Uh, this is somebody, this is an instance in which somebody should be canceled and they, there should be an example made of him. Uh, and there's no two ways about it. You know, it almost seems like ever since God said to Israel, you are my chosen people, they've been attacked over and over again, and anti-Semitism is stronger now more than ever. Have you noticed that? Absolutely. It's everywhere. It's on college campuses and it's propagated from the top down. This is not something that starts with the students. It actually ends with the students. It starts with the professors and the administration. And you know what, Hal? Every time there is not action taken by the administration and by those college professors and by people who are running Adidas and everyone else, there will be consequences. That, that is how this spreads. People wonder how the Holocaust happened. It didn't happen overnight. There were signs in society. Nobody stopped them. No one condemned them. Everyone brushed it away. And that's what happened. Uh, and you know what? Here, we are responsible. We're responsible when someone is racist. We're responsible when someone is a homophobe or somebody is, you know, uh, you know, shows hatred against Asians or any other minority group. And in this case, this is we live in a Judeo-Christian Western world in which these these values need to be protected. People need to be protected. You know, Judaism is not just a religion, it's a culture. And this is not just a problem for Jews. It's an American problem. It's a Canadian problem. It's a problem wherever it happens. It's a problem for all of society. And that's why it needs to be stopped. Amen to that. She's one of our regular contributors, Lisa Daftari. Thanks so much for joining us today from the Foreign Desk in Los Angeles. My pleasure. Thank you, Hal.